Hello everyone, can anyone hear me? Can you see me? <laughs> so there is a bit of a lag between um, what I'm doing and what um, is shown on the stream. It's maybe 10 to 15 seconds. Um, so if I don't answer your question right away, just give me a sec. Hello Julie, hello Liz, how are ya? Hi Michelle. All right, I'm still just prepping a few things here and there, so let me just potter around a little bit while we wait for some more people to join us, and then I will start. How are you all doing today? Hi Anne. So I'm just getting a few things um, that I will need and then I can show you some stuff. <laughs> Alrighty, let me think, where did I put my cloth? Um, All right, so I'll quickly run through what I'm doing today. Um, so a lot of people ask, oh uh, yeah, Julie, it's very hot in uh, Sydney as well today. It's 32 degrees. Um, and uh, I, I was smart enough to come into my studio and turn the air conditioner on uh, before I <laughs> started anything. So go past Mitchell. <laughs> um, so what I'm doing today is I get a lot uh, of questions about how I made the tables for my cafe and uh, what my preparation technique is to get this sort of stuff ready uh, to paint and sell. Hi Gail from Canada, welcome. Glad you could join me. I know it's um, uh, evening over there, so thanks for joining. Um, so yeah, tables for my cafe um, and how I make them. So uh, I've happen to have some extra tables uh, so I made the three for outside and I'll be uploading that video uh, very soon I have to edit it um, but it's already they're all done and they look phenomenal so I thought I'd take you on uh, my process on how I actually do that um, and in this case I'm using uh, reclaimed wood so these were the old tables from my cafe um, and oh, I'm going to be uh, priming them and getting them ready to turn into workable tables. So I don't know what kind of wood this is. It's woody and it's brown. It's brown and woody. Um, <laughs> that's about my, the extent of my knowledge of wood. Um, I know it's not pine because pine uh, splinters very easily and it doesn't have the same uh, wood grain as this. So if I was going to hazard a guess, I'd say oak could even be acacia, but acacia is usually a little bit darker. Now, when I got these tables, they were covered in like a thick lacquer, thick, really brown, disgusting lacquer. And what I've done is I've taken my belt sander with some 40 grit sandpaper and sanded that back as much as I can. Uh, then I did another layer of 80 grit sandpaper just to take that back even further. And then with my random orbital sander, I've sanded this down to 120 grit. So I've done the top, the bottom, and all of the sides, and now they are nice and smooth and ready to seal. So the first thing that I do when I'm uh, looking at my tables is I'm looking for any holes or spots that may be in the surface, um, and I always pick one side to work with over another. So with these tables, they had the bases screwed in, and I can often tell which side it is because there's holes where the screws were. So they were screwed in on this side and so this would be the optimal side to use because that would be a flat one. The top side of these tables uh, had dents and divots in them just from people uh, wear general wear and tear, people placing glasses and things down onto it um, so the surface is not completely flat. Now what I could do is I could take this to my local woodworking shop um, and they can uh, pass it through a planer and putting that through the planer will basically flatten out both surfaces and make them parallel to each other. 
Okay, so if you do have a piece of reclaimed wood that's a bit warped, you can do that. Um, they can put it through a jointer as well, and that will get all of your sides, tabletop, everything nice and square. So that's what I would recommend to start with, um, but I'm just reusing these um, as is. And the reason I'm not using the bottom for this particular table is because this was the first table that I actually used the belt sander on, and it was the first time I'd ever used a belt sander, and my 40 grit sandpaper absolutely destroyed the wood here um, and it's just bit in and taken away too far too much um, so I don't want that to be my painted side because I'll see dents and um, all of that grain showing up so this will be the bottom okay no one sees that so this table in particular I'm actually going to leave aside because and eh, no, I stuff it I might as well seal it anyway um, I was gonna say I'll flatten it out but I couldn't be bothered so we're going to get started with the first step in getting these ready. So does anyone have any questions so far? Basically, sanded all the, sand, all, all the varnish, old lacquer off, anything that's going to interfere with the paint. Um, and now we're ready to clean and prime everything down uh, for the next step, which will be sealing. All right, any questions, any comments? Welcome to anyone that's just joined. Okay, so uh, once I've got everything sanded back, which is already done, I just take a microfiber cloth. This is just a one you get in the pack from the hardware store or cleaning shop, wherever you get them from. You can buy them at most um, supermarkets. And I'm just wiping this down. You do not want to apply any moisture to this. Um, uh, because it will soak into the wood. So yeah, it's a uh, microfiber cloth, like that's what they're called here. Um, you could use paper towel, anything that's just going to pick up the dust. Um, and as you can see, there is a lot of sawdust because we've sanded both sides. So I'm going to do all of the sides and all of the edges. Now the other thing you could do, uh, these tabletops have a very sheer edge. Um, what you could do is take a router and route around the edges just so they've got a bit of a rounded edge on them. I'm going to keep them as is um, because I'm lazy. So <laughs> they'll remain as is. Um, but yeah, you just want to get all of that sawdust off so that you're not sealing it in with your varnish. But it doesn't make much of a difference. You're not going to see any sawdust that gets sealed in because you're going to be chucking a layer of paint over the top anyway. The only time you would want to be really careful of that is if you wanted to keep the natural grain of the wood and do like a clear pillow on this or you wanted to do you know a specific design on it in which case you may want to stain your wood first um, you can do whatever you want to prep with it that's entirely up to you I guess so this one is now clean and I'm just going to prop it up on some uh, plastic bowls and it doesn't need to be it doesn't need to be level it just needs to be stable. So the bowls are just there for support to lift it off the bench. Um, and that's going to allow us to get our roller in nice and close to the edges. So I'm going to do that one today and I'm going to prime this one. Oh, there's a little, little spider. Um, so I also have this Lazy Susan. Now this Lazy Susan, I actually filmed a video of this um, maybe a year and a half ago. It was really, really long time ago. And uh, it turned out terrible. It was a rainbow pour and it looked absolutely ridiculous. So I used my belt sander again and uh, my orbital sander and I've just sanded this back to bare wood. So this is ready to paint for a second time and give it a second chance. Um, when you're sanding paint, be very careful, take it very slow, um, and you do have to use quite a bit of force because the paint is basically a dried plastic. And when you're grinding that away, it's just going to heat up and ball up and you'll get like a squishy, disgusting paint plastic stuff. So yeah, just be uh, wary when you're sanding off paint um, that it can be quite thick and not exactly what you'd expect. Um, so I am going to wipe down all of the tables that I have on the side here, just so I know that they're ready to prime. And it is important to sand and seal every side, every face, every corner um, properly, because we need to varnish absolutely everything. Now, this small table 
was one of the ones that we had on the outside of our cafe. And I'll show you all of these spots are places where the varnish or the lacquer was worn away. And that's just years of, you know, coffee build up and drinks being spilt and all that sort of stuff. So really important to sand it back as much as possible. And now there's no moisture in this anymore. That's all long gone um, and it's been dry for quite some time. So on this side, this is the side that I'm going to be using to uh, do my artworks on. Now, this one does have some holes in it. So there are a couple of ways that you can fill these little holes just from the screws. Um, you can use a bit of what's called builder's bog, uh, which will just fill those up nicely. You could use a little bit of plaster or you could use some uh, spack fill, which is the stuff that you put on uh, your walls in your plaster. I today am going to do a little bit of UV resin. So that's going to seal up that hole. Sorry while I rummage around for my UV light. I just realized I'm live and don't, can't edit this out. <laughs> you can tell how prepared I was, right? So um, where's another PowerPoint over here? Okay. So to fill the holes, I'm going to use my UV resin and then we'll lightly sand it back if there are any lumps and bumps. Yeah, that'll do. Okay. Okay, now I am going to get my respirator because UV resin stinks to high heavens. And I don't want to be breathing in those fumes as it cures. All right. So like I said, this is all part of the process and this is exactly how I would do it normally. So on with the respirator. All right, got to figure out how this ties up. Now, can you all still hear me okay? I've got my microphone on, um, so it should, shouldn't be too, too bad. Uh, I may be a little bit muted. Um, and I should wear gloves when doing this but I'm just going to be very careful not to get any on my hands. And I'm just going to squeeze a tiny bit into each hole that we need to fill. And you can do this with all your cracks, all your crevices. Just fill the holes up. Okay. Another one here because uh, ultimately when we put our paint and our resin on top of this you will see all of those little nooks and crannies and I'm just going to okay, this isn't going to work so let me just grab another power cord here's one I prepared earlier all right so we're going to turn on our Oh, UV light when I finally get my shit in order. <laughs> Alright, so UV lights can get very hot, so don't touch them if you can. And what I've noticed is the UV resin on this side, this hole in particular, is soaking into the wood. So I'm just going to add a little bit more to seal that hole. Right, and it shouldn't take too long. There's not too much UV resin here. Uh, so you just want to cure it until it's hard. And then we will sand it back. So again, the resin is sinking into the holes. So wood filler would be the best option. Because that will form a natural wood bond. Um, but we're painting over this. So everything's going to be covered by a layer of paint anyway. It's nice and hard. Now UV resin cures by the UV light generating heat. So if you don't have enough heat from your UV light, it's not going to cure your resin. So that, that will end up with tacky resin and you don't want that. So I'm just holding the light nice and close, getting as much of that cured as I can. Does anyone have any questions for me? I'm all yours. Ask away doesn't even have to be about these tables. 
I like to think I'm a pretty proficient woodworker if you have any woodworking questions. So these are going pretty good, nice and cured. And I will wipe my hands with some isopropyl alcohol afterwards to get rid of the uh, sticky residue from the resin. You can use uh, regular detergent um, that will help break down the resin, or you can use some olive oil. Olive oil is great for uh, breaking down resin and baby oil, any sort of oily um, chemical. So. If you don't have isopropyl alcohol, use some oil that will help break down the bonds in the resin and help you clean up as well. So we're nearly done. Just making sure everything's set. And sometimes you can just leave the UV light on there. The particular UV light that I'm using is from Amazon. And I think it was only like $30. But it's a 100 watt UV light. So it's very strong. Uh, very powerful. And it will definitely cure any resin. It's str strong enough to cure any form of resin. Of UV resin I should add. Okay. So now that that's done going to take off my mask because all of the fumes have been deactivated now. Hello Laurie from Wisconsin and hello Bonnie's Fluid Art Creations. Hi. Okay so this one's done. I'm going to leave my UV resin over where it belongs and I'm just going to grab some sandpaper so excuse my rustling. And a sanding block. Okay. So I've got sandpaper, I have a sanding block, and my dust mask, which is up here. And this is just going to prevent me from inhaling any yucky resin fumes or, or um, dust. And so I'm just wrapping my sanding block in some 120 grit sandpaper. I believe it's 120. 180. Doesn't make much of a difference. And we're just going to sand down the lumps of UV resin. Just until they are flush with the surface of the wood. I'm also taking this opportunity to uh, check to see if there are any marks from the belt sander because all of those marks will run in one direction, which they do, they run this way. Just using my finger to check if everything's nice and flat. And that is pretty good. That one will be fine, that'll be fine, that'll be fine. Okay. So, now that we've created all of this um, sanding dust, I am just going to tip this onto my floor. And then I'm going to wipe this down again, and then I'm going to wipe my table and the sides of my board 
Now, normally I would sand everything outside, away from the art, away from the resin, away from, you know, creating so much dust inside my studio. But for the purposes of this video, I think that's fine. Okay, now this side is perfectly smooth and ready to seal. So we've got most of that sawdust off. Let me quickly wipe down. Oh, you know what? I'll wait to do those because I may need to seal them with UV resin as well. So I'll just put all my sandpaper and the cloth aside. And my respirator as well. Um, so a handy trick with your respirators. Um, so once the cartridges are exposed to air, um, they start to lose their effectiveness because they're absorbing all the toxins from the air. So what I learnt was to keep it inside an airtight bag or an airtight container and it will extend the life of your respirator, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, filters, that's what it is. Filters is the word. English, English is difficult. Okay, so sanding is done. Just give me one sec, I'll just wash my hands. Do, 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 do. Just get all this sawdust off my hands um, because that will make things a little bit more difficult in the coming minutes. All right. And now I'm going to prop up this piece of wood and we're just gonna seal these two for this demonstration. So that should be fine. Uh, like I said before, these don't have to be level. They just have to be propping this board up off the table so that we've got space to work around it. Uh, this one I'm gonna turn sideways. And doing this method, I can do three to four tables at a time uh, and get everything done in a nice production line. All right, who have we got? Hi, Wendy. Uh, I get the UV resin on Amazon. I do have two different types and there is one that I prefer. So this is the first one that I ordered that you see sometimes online on YouTube. Um, and this one's called UV Resin Hard. Um, this one absolutely freaking reeks and I don't like it at all. Um, I've also had trouble with this one uh, turning yellow and not setting fully. So I do have a residue on top. Um, so the only time I would use this is if I know that I'm going to do a second layer of UV resin and I'm putting the other one on top. And in saying that, the other one is this J Diction UV resin. Now when used with the UV light that I have, this sets hard every single time, haven't had a problem with it and it's absolutely fantastic. Um, again, uh, Amazon, they are incredibly expensive. UV resins are not cheap. So if you're going to use them, um, yeah, be prepared for, you know, an exorbitant cost. All right, so uh, again, those are from Amazon. And I probably should put my phone on silent because it's uh, just telling me, you know, that I'm live on YouTube. I know that. <laughs> I'm very well aware. Okay. Next step in the painting process or in the preparation process is to... Um, put on some gloves and we're going to apply the varnish. So, you know what? I don't even need the gloves. So this is the easiest step of the whole process is applying the varnish to the table. And um, I'm just going to answer Gail's question. Gail asked where to get the little plastic bowls. Um, they used to sell these at the cheap shops, um, especially if you're in Australia. They're just party bowls. You would see them at kids' birthday parties with nuts and lollies and chocolates and stuff in them. Um, just at your cheap shops, but they don't make them anymore because they're not allowed to sell them. Um, pretty much all of Australia has banned the sale and use of plastic cutlery and bowls. <coughs> Excuse me. So they're very hard to find. Um, I would suggest Amazon, eBay, or use um, paper ones. Uh, paper ones will just do the job just as well. Um, I like them because they're nice and short. Excuse me, just need a drink of water. They're nice and short and they fit into my drying rack between the spaces between the racks uh, really nicely with my coasters on them so I can stack as many as I can fit onto my drying rack. All right, so now is the, you know, 
crux of preparing these tables. So they're nice and flat, nice and smooth, and they've been sanded, and we're ready to apply our first layer of varnish. So the varnish I love uh, for this step is called Monocell Bondol uh, clear wood varnish. You buy this from Bunnings. It's a gloss varnish and it's fantastic. It's made to go on in one coat so that you can pretty much do one coat of uh, varnish on your floorboards or on your chopping boards and stuff like that. Uh, the other one that I've used, and I think I threw out the, the tub the other day, uh, the other one that I've used is uh, One Coat, I believe it's called. It's got a blue label on it. Uh, one coat, again, really nice, super thick, um, goes on really lovely, and again, made to go on in one coat to seal whatever project you're working on. So important with this to give it a little bit of a, a little bit of a stir, a little bit of a mix. I just shake the tin because we're rolling this on. We're not worried about bubbles or anything like that. Uh, the directions do say to sand in between coats. I don't find that necessary unless you've got like really severe drips and everything. Um, but at the same time, when we do bigger pieces of art, um, we're going to have unnatural drips and things on it anyway. Um, this is a wooden board that I poured on a while ago. Um, and, you know, the edges aren't perfectly smooth. The resin doesn't always dry perfectly smooth on the edges. So I'm not too fussed about side texture. Um, but if you are, then sand between your coats and make sure that everything is nice and flat when you do that. Alright, so lid off on this one. And something very important to remember is wipe the rim of your varnish container when you are done with it um, because you'll get boogers and stuff dried up in there and it can find its way onto your art piece, which you don't want. So I'm going to take a paper towel and just wipe around the inside of that rim so none of that falls into my varnish like it already has. Now, I am a bit of a fiend when it comes to using varnish because I just dip the end of the roller into the container and then, you know, go for it. But the problem with that is once I've dipped it in once and I've picked up some leftover sawdust from here, I tend to dip it back in the varnish. So this is definitely not a finishing varnish. It's more of a preparation one for me. Um, but you could use this as a final coat if you wanted to on top of your artwork. Um, it's just a gloss varnish, dries like anything else. Um, and I would say it's a little bit more durable than some art varnishes, but, you know, use whatever works for you, I say. Now, this is my little roller. I haven't cleaned this roller in six months. I've never cleaned it, to be honest. It's, it was a brand new roller when I started using it. Um, and all I do is wrap it in a plastic bag, wrap it up nice and tight, and it's good to go. Now, uh, this particular one has dried out just a little bit too much. I think I've pushed it past its limits. So I am going to change it. It's just a little bit crusty. So let me just grab a freshie. That one. This one. All right. Now I do apologize if I'm making lots of noise in your ears. I forget that I'm wearing a microphone sometimes and um, yeah. All right, so the, why won't you go in? The rollers that I love to use, these are high density foam rollers uh, from Bunnings. I get these in a two pack. You can, where's the camera? There we go. I get these in a two pack because um, I don't use them that often. So, oh, who's that? Uh, hi, Andrew. Welcome, thank you. Um, yeah, these are the high density foam rollers. 100 millimeter, you can get longer ones, you can get shorter ones, whole heap of thing. Um, I really like them because they're nice and firm, nice and squishy too, um, and they don't leave as many bubbles as a high nap roller would, so like a paint roller. Um, those are absolutely atrocious, so I wouldn't recommend those for this unless you defluff them first. All right, so now we're going to apply the varnish to the top of the board. Um, to do that, I am going to grab a measuring cup, not for any purpose other than to scoop varnish out and put it onto our surface. And I just do a little squiggle like that. We can always add a little bit more. And you do want a really good thick coat of varnish 
on this. So let's just get our brush roller saturated and I sort of just apply it and push that varnish around, sort of show it who's boss. So the end result we're looking for with this is to make sure that the wood is fully sealed and you'll see it change colour from the lighter wood to where it's a bit darker. And I'll go halfway up a row so you can see that. Okay, so not sure if you can tell. Let's focus. So up here, the colour is, there we go, the colour is a little bit lighter because it hasn't been sealed yet. And where the varnish is here, it's wet, so the colour of the wood has changed. That's what we're looking for, and we want the wood to soak up as much varnish as possible. All right, uh, Laurie, how much would you, would, uh, sorry, Laurie asks, would I varnish wooden boxes before you paint on them? Yes, anything that's made of wood, um, I would varnish first. Um, actually, if it's a box, probably not. The reason I varnish these is so they do not warp. And I varnish all sides of whatever I'm doing so they don't bend and warp. I don't think a box is as likely to do that because it has the support on all of the sides. So probably not. It, does, it just depends on how thin the wood is and how the box is constructed. Um, it's entirely up to you. If it's one of those like wooden crates with all the slats that sort of looks like a pallet, don't even bother. Like That's not going to warp anywhere. Um, if it's an MDF box, maybe it's entirely up to you, I guess. I've never done it, so yeah, I would have to see what kind of box it actually is. So we've done the top, and now I'm going to do the sides. So just constantly putting varnish in the center, and then for the sides, I just take my roller and roll around the sides, nice and easy. Now, because this wood has open end grain, I'm taking my roller and dabbing the end into that end grain so it soaks up all the wood and it seals it. By doing this over multiple coats, you may even completely fill in that end grain and it's not an issue and you'll have a nice flat side when you paint. Okay, if it is a problem for you, you can just sand it um, completely flush until you don't have that end grain issue anymore. So just apply some more varnish to the roller. And my method with this is you can never have too much varnish on here. We're gonna do two or three coats on this once everything's dry. Um, and like I said, the goal is to get the wood to soak up as much of that varnish as possible to block all of the wood pores from absorbing any moisture. And that's gonna mean that the wood can't warp because there's no moisture going in or out of the wood. So that's what causes warping, is if you sealed only one side, painted on this side and then didn't do anything to the bottom and it was sanded and wasn't lacquered, um, all of the moisture would pass into the wood and out and that that's what when you get your bending and your warping. So doing this, I haven't had any issues. I've done, I think, 10 tables now. Um, and it doesn't matter what size I'm working with, or how thick it is, I always do this because there's always the chance that you can get some warping happening. Okay, and it's a nice quick process. You can see that, what was it, five minutes, 10 minutes? MDF is really um, sturdy. I do like the MDF. However, I don't know if the MDF here is different to the MDF over in the States. Um, because I have done, whoops, just splattered varnish all over my floor. Um, yeah, I don't know if our MDF here is different to what you use over there, um, but if our MDF here even gets ever so slightly wet, it turns to pulp. Um, and I, I know this from first-hand experience. I built a new upgrade for my uh, work table, which is just behind the camera. Um, I made an extension. I made the tabletop out of MDF. And the MDF, I thought, oh, um, I was going to varnish it, and I applied, oh, I had to, I spilt something. So I wiped it off with a wet wipe, 
and the moisture from that wet wipe caused that one particular spot to swell um, and it wasn't even on there for a minute. Um, I just left the wet wipe on the bench for a couple of seconds, uh, realized what I'd done, took it off and it had already absorbed so much moisture that it swelled um, and then pretty much turned to pulp. So I had to wait until it was dry and sand it all back. So yeah, like I said, I don't know if it's different over in the States for what you have as MDF, but ours is very um, prone to warping with moisture. So that's why I don't take any chances and I seal absolutely everything. Now, I did make a mistake, and my mistake was I applied a little bit of varnish to this one, as you would have watched me do, and then I did that one. And what's happened is my varnish has dried around the edges and left a texture. So what I'll have to do is once this coat is set and it's dry, I'll come in with my sandpaper and sand that nice and flat. So the way that you apply your varnish is entirely up to you. You could use a brush, you can use a roller. Roller is nice and quick, nice and easy. Um, if you had a spray gun, oh, wouldn't that go quick? <laughs> um, I don't think I do enough tables to warrant buying a full spray gun and spraying on my varnish. Um, I do find that this gives me a lot of control as well. I can see exactly where I've done already. I know where I have to go back over it. And if I can offer a piece of advice is to make sure that your workstation is able to be accessed from multiple sides. So you can see I've got mine set up on a table here. And hi Nikki. Um, you see, I've got mine set up on a table that I can move in and out and I can push side to side um, so I can access all areas of the table. And what I'm doing is every now and then I'm just checking to see if there's any drips. So drips on the underside. Again, once they're dry, you can just sand them off. Um, and we are going to do multiple coats of varnish on each of these pieces, like I said before. Um, Honestly, you can't do too many coats. You want to get this, like I keep saying, as sealed as possible. You don't want any moisture to be able to come in or out of this wood. So I'm just really squeezing out the roller now and making sure I get as much of the product out of the roller as possible. And that's pretty much done for the first coat. So I'm just going to grab some more plastic bags. Da, 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 there we go. So whenever you're not using your roller, chuck it in a plastic bag. So straight in and then I like to double bag them. And then all I do is grab the sides of the bag and twist it around. Airtight seal, and that is not going to dry out at all. Okay? Like I said, that last one I had for months. So, now we're at this stage. Okay? And we're waiting for this to dry. So, the wood has pretty much soaked up a lot of that varnish, and it's dry to the touch. We can speed up the drying process of the varnish to help it set quicker with a hairdryer. So just to demonstrate, I will grab my hairdryer. All right, grab it. Oh, come on. Okay, everything's on hooks and in the way of everything else in my studio. I may seem organized, but I really am not. <laughs> Plug her in. What's the bet it's already on? Yep. Ah, nope. That one. Okay. <laughs> I always hit the buttons as I take it off the hooks. All right, so uh, with these, low setting or high fan, um, just on cold, and that's going to be enough to set the varnish and dry it really, really quickly.
All right. So the reason I love this mono cell bondol um, varnish is it dries super, super, super quick. So uh, we're ready for our second coat already. Okay. And you can see how the prep work really doesn't take long at all. Now I am going to go over the just very lightly the surface of this one uh, where I left the varnish. Okay, not taking off too much material. I'm just sanding back that thin layer of res uh, varnish to get rid of the texture that I left on there. Just wiping that off with my hands. And I'm just noticing the pattern of the wood. Someone constructed this very shonkily. That is, none of the panels are straight at all. <laughs> uh, clearly wasn't done by me because they wouldn't be any better. Okay, so then to do our second coat, I know it looks a little bit boring, but this process hasn't served me wrong yet, and hopefully when you guys do anything with wood, uh, it's going to help you out as well. So again, liberal coat of varnish on this, and you can easily get a whole set of tables prepped in you know, one night. What have we been going for? 45 minutes or so. And we've already done one coat, already up to the second coat. Now, if you find that you're getting too much varnish on there, I usually just take it straight over to the second table and work it in. Remember, you can never have too many coats. So again, on the sides, filling in that end grain, and that's going to help to flatten this out. Um, I do find that when you pour the paint on, because we use, I use the house paint for the blooms, the house paint is really thick, so it helps to block those uh, wood pores anyway. So one side's done, second side's done, third side's done, fourth side is done. And then any leftover varnish on the top here, just rolling back and forth, and we're going to work that in. So that first layer soaks into the wood. The second layer seals the wood. So uh, any bits that didn't get fully absorbed. And you want to use a gloss varnish so you form a thick plastic barrier against any moisture coming in or out of that wood. So that's essentially what the products we're working with are. They're plastics. And by applying them to the, to the top, you stop any of that moisture coming in or out. Okay, any questions, guys? All right, so again, just going around the outsides, checking for any lumps of white, which is uh, excess varnish, making sure that I haven't applied too much, and just smooth that out because it is easier to get rid of now than having to sand it back. So that's all just the varnish that comes off the underside. Just get rid of it. And we're gonna start on this one, coat number two. Um, now I did use the hair dryer to speed up the drying of the first coat. Uh, with the second one, best to let it air dry. Uh, and that's just gonna make sure that it doesn't um, crack or crumble or do anything strange because uh, you can choose to do a third coat. Um, the second coat is the one that's actually going to give you the nice smooth finish um, for your paint to go on. Okay, a uh, handy tip when you're rolling. When you roll the sides, you're going to get a lip of paint that comes up on the top. When you're pulling that in, pull that from the outside into the center. 
using a diagonal motion and that will help get rid of that lip of varnish. Uh, same if you're rolling paint, we'll do exactly the same. And I do like to go over the pattern multiple times because every now and then you can get the roller that leaves textures on the surface. Um, that texture pretty much dries up um, as soon as you know the varnish is dry. Uh, but you do want to try and smooth that out as much as possible. Just in case your paint is really thin. So if you're doing a technique other than blooms, uh, you might see the texture of the varnish underneath. So just trying to get that as uniform as possible will really help to avoid any texture showing up in your final artwork as well. Very gentle there, gentle there, gentle there, and done. Okay, this is looking pretty good. I'm happy with those. Let me just check this side because I didn't check this side. There we go. And I'll grab any extra from underneath. Plenty of um, varnish on the bottom of this one. I'm just going to put that back on the top and work that in. All right, that's it for those two, I think. Let's see, I'm not sure if you already said it, but do you varnish the underside? Yes, Wendy, I do varnish the underside. Um, I do varnish the underside. You, you have to varnish all sides, all faces, any exposed wood, anything on the top, anything on the sides, anything underneath. Um, if you've got a, a piece that's you know, got a hole in it, you want to varnish inside the hole. You basically want to prevent any areas that moisture can get out from actually being able to leak moisture. Um, and trust me when I say, if you don't do a good enough job, the moisture will find a way out um, and you will get warping. So even from the tiniest portion of unsealed wood, you will get warping. So uh, let me put this back into the bags. And then that's pretty much it for this lot of prep. And I'll just put the lid back on my container. I'll wash that up in a sec. Now uh, I'll show you the difference between the unsealed wood, so this nice light coloured wood, and the wood up here on the table. So the main difference you'll see is if you shine a light on them, one will be glossy and one will be completely matte. So your uh, wood here that's unsealed will be matte finish. Uh, it's not going to reflect much light at all. However, a piece of wood with two coats of gloss varnish on there, look how much light you're getting reflected off that. Okay, so I'll probably do a third coat on these. I'll come back in about an hour and apply a third coat. This second coat's already pretty much dry to the touch. Um, so I'll just wait an hour, let that cure a little bit. Uh, I'll come and do a third coat. Then I'll flip them upside down and I'll seal the undersides as well. The undersides I'll do another three coats um, and I do tend to do uh, an extra two or three coats on the sides when I do the underside as well. Okay, so that's pretty much it for this live session. Um, that's how I start prepping my tables. Um, and I do want to do more of these live sessions exactly uh, in the order that I do do my process so you can see how I make them, the time frame it takes for me to make uh, a piece like this. So uh, I'll let this cure once it's got three coats either side, I'll let this cure for about three or four days just to make sure that that wood has absorbed all of the varnish, the plastic is set, the varnish is set. Um, 
and give that time to degas any chemicals that may be in it uh, to come off. Uh, so that way when we put our paint on top, we're not going to get any bubbles or cracking or anything happening with our paint. Now the paint should stick to this with no issue. That's what they're designed to do. Um, but we always want to reduce any risk of anything happening, especially with paint pouring because it's a lot of bloody paint that we use, right? So, um, let me think. So we'll run through the steps again. So taken from a raw product, a raw table, sanded with um, 80 grit sandpaper or 40 grit sandpaper if you've got a lot of buildup on there. Took it to 120 grit to make it nice and smooth. Then we've wiped it down with a uh, microfiber cloth. Fill any holes with either wood filler. I used UV resin in this case. Doesn't really matter as long as you get those holes filled. Otherwise, you'll see the texture in your finished pour. Uh, fill the holes up. Sand them back so you've got a nice flat surface again. Uh, if your surface is really rough, uh, put it through a planer. Take it to a wood shop and use a planer. And then we've applied our gloss varnish. So again, use a roller. You can use a brush if you prefer. Use a rag, whatever you like. As long as you've got a nice smooth finish and you're left with no texture on the top and you'll be good to pour. Do this on any wood. It shouldn't warp. Um, we discussed earlier uh, MDF. Uh, MDF is supposed to not warp as badly as uh, other woods do. However, I've experienced warping with all kinds of woods. So just as a fail safe for my own knowledge, um, I do this for every single wooden piece that I make, unless it's a cradled wood board. Cradled wood boards, you don't have to worry about. So if they've got a brace around the back, the whole purpose of that is to stop warping. So you can definitely pour on those um, without worry of them warping. Um, but here's a little uh, placemat that I did a little while ago. Uh, I sealed this as well. This has got two coats of varnish on it um, uh, before I poured on top. So, you know, seal everything, mitigate your damages and make sure that you, you know, don't risk getting warping and you won't have warping. Um, another thing that you can use to pour on that I found um, a great use for, uh, because I have a whole lot of them, is uh, cake boards. So this is actually a 10 inch round cake decorating board. So it's sturdy, it's MDF on the inside, but it's sealed with a gold or silver foil and it has a paper backing. So when you paint or pour on this, that acts as a barrier for any of the moisture to escape. So I just poured straight onto the silver foil and you know, it, it works just like a normal pouring surface. So if you want something that's relatively cheap, um, I remember I got a box of 50 of these and I think it was like $35. Um, so they're not overly expensive and if you're looking for cheaper pouring surfaces, cake boards are a good bet. Uh, Wendy, yes, I will definitely take you through the resin process. Uh, I, I really mean it when I say this is a start to finish um, and the resin is the most fun part for these because they are so big, you just get to mush, you know, resin all over the place. So. Yeah, it's quite fun. <laughs> I like it. All right, guys, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, like I said, I'll come back, put another coat on this um, in about an hour and go from there. And then I'll flip it over, do the other side, uh, and I'll let you know when we're ready for uh, part two, which will be painting. All right, so I'm going to end the live here. Oh, I, uh, Laurie said, I want to stain the bottom of the box and paint the top, so do I still seal the bottom and sides? Um, if you're going to stain it, you have to stain it first because the wood needs to absorb the stain. The stain actually stains the fibres. Um, you can uh, seal the stain after that if you wanted to do you know, a painting design on top. Um, from experience, um, let me see if I've still got one actually. Yes, I do. Okay, so this is another reason why you always seal wood, especially if you're gonna paint on top and especially if it's treated pine. This was a wood round that I got from Bunnings. It was pine um, and I did not seal this before I painted it. Those marks are all the natural oils from the wood coming through the paint. So lesson learned was seal the wood before you pour on it or before you paint it. So that was just a layer of um, 
white paint on there and you can see that the varnish that I used on this, I'm pretty sure I used the one coat varnish, the other one that I liked, um, and the varnish is yellowing. Now this has been in uh, storage space, so there's no way it should be yellowing, it was just a cheap varnish. Um, but yeah, that wood oil is causing the varnish to yellow, it's causing the paint to yellow, so always seal everything, seal both sides. You can see this side is unsealed, um, I didn't varnish over the top of this side and same thing all of that oil is coming out of the wood so to prevent especially on white pillow to prevent any oil coming out of this wood into my white pillow that plastic coat is going to prevent all of that all right so yeah you can stain first like I said if you're going to do something like a clear pillow stain it first so it soaks into the wood then apply your varnish on top and that will lock everything in so it doesn't bleed Alright guys, I'm going to leave it there and I will, like I said, I'll post in the Shelly Out group, I'll post in the Crazy Train and the Piggy group when I'm doing the second one and we'll do some painting on these. Um, I may also seal the other tables I have in the meantime just so that they're ready and I can have a full painting day because I do have my workspace set up for paint and not resin at the moment. Um, so yeah, I like to get everything done all at once. Alright, I will catch you later guys. Thanks so much for joining me and if you are watching this later and you have any questions, just ask in the comments and I'll happily answer if I can. Alright, take it easy guys. Now where is the button to end the stream? Haha, <laughs> there it is. Bye!